We are in connection with Canada, young people, uh, talking to them. We can hear you. Dr. Hadi, we can hear you. Uh, I see, okay. Because I'm, <laughs> I'm Facebooking it as well. MashaAllah. <laughs> you, book, you book my face, I face your book. <laughs> Okay, so okay, so I'm excited to have uh, Dr. Hadley join us uh, for this uh, hour. We do our best to try to bring people that we can who we can learn from. And as we all talked about, you guys are working on trying to have your impact project and trying to have a cause. You focus on that cause and trying to drive what you want to be doing. Um, we want to hear and learn from Dr. Hani his experience, his journey uh, that led him to what he has accomplished, alhamdulillah. So he is a, a, a medical doctor by profession, but he's the founder of Islamic Relief, which is the largest humanitarian uh, organization or Muslim organization in the West. Uh, they're not just, you guys know them by Islamic Relief Canada, but they are all over the world, mashallah, in so many branches everywhere. Uh, not only that, he also founded a lot of other charities after Islamic Relief. And Alhamdulillah, he's still very active in uh, connecting with the youth, in advising, in mentoring a lot of organizations and a lot of leaders. So I want you to uh, show a warm welcome for Dr. Hani for joining us today. Actually, he, he likes the waves and the hands up. So if you want all of that to show it to him, that would be fantastic. <laughs> So, Dr. Hadi, Jazakallah khair for taking time uh, uh, and to join us. And uh, may Allah bless you and continue to put barakah on everything that you do and give you success in this life and the after. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give you and your family, inshallah. We grant you all genital firdaus, bihamdulillah. So, we want to start maybe uh, with like an origin story. <laughs> Try to tell us a little bit about how your, your how we, first of all, maybe Islamic relief, how he came to be. Oh, I see. And then tell us a little bit more about your experience in general in the in, in, in the whole uh, field of uh, social service. Okay. Alhamdulillah, Salaam Rasulullah. Thank you very much for inviting me to be with uh, young people because I'm always feeling young. I'm at the age of 17 and a half, younger than everybody in the room, especially the one who is hiding behind you, brother, the one who is wearing the, yes, you the red t-shirt I said yes <laughs> how we started we started with no plan with no vision with no budget with no office with no strategy with nothing we were the nothing people to start from nothing to make something don't ever wait for money or for people or for anybody to give you the kickstart. No, you start yourself. If you believe in something... Dr. Hadi? Yes? Sorry. <laughs> wait a second. <laughs> yes? Yes? Sorry, Dr. Hadi, we just had a technical difficulty. All right, we all go back. We can see you, and if you can speak, hopefully we can hear you. Technical difficulty, look at the people from Africa. Look down at the people from Canada who have technical difficulty because they don't have the technology of Africa. Thank you, Canada. <laughs> How we started? Say it again. Again and again and again. We started from nowhere to go somewhere. From nothing to do something. At the time when we started, it was just an idea. An idea. At the back of our mind. No budget, no office, no address, no plan, no strategy, no big guys, no big organization. We were all the time legging the road. Taking the buses, at that time we did not have a car, C-A-R. 
I used to take buses and go from my medical school when I was doing my research to the little address every Saturday to open a small donation box which was the headquarter of Islamic Leaf at 1984. A small donation box cost us 16 pounds to put inside it all the checks and the letters we received. This is how we started. This is how we started. Very simple. No complication. No big guys. No big strategies. Nothing. At that time, it was uh, a friend of mine, Dr. Ahsan, who was doing his PhD in chemistry, and myself. And doing it on voluntary basis. We never realized that today, on the 4th of the Hijjah, and the 3rd of July 2021, we'll have a hundred young people in the middle of Canada or Toronto listening to someone like myself after 38 years of legging the world. Can you leg the world, sisters, in the first table? You can, if you believe that the world is a piece of land that you have to cover it from end to end. You can do that. It depends how you believe, the way you believe, and the strength and the depth of your belief. Nothing is impossible. We had no nothing. The first donation was 20 pence, as I mentioned, from a young boy at the age of nine. And we went ahead, door to door, shop to shop, street to street, mosque to mosque, city to city, even during Ramadan. People in the office never used to be in the office for the whole month. Never had a breakfast or iftari with the family. From the first day we were out to distribute leaflets with a van. We used to call it caravan tour. This 1985-86. And every night we used to spend the night in a mosque in a different city. While we are in this city or in this township, we used to visit different mosques. To do what? To speak, to connect, to distribute leaflets, door to door, hand to hand to the people. So we were legging UK for 30 or 28 nights in Ramadan. We used to come back even on the Eid day or sometime. On the Eid day we don't have the breakfast with our family because we stand outside the mosque to collect money. Or if we're abroad, like in Latin America, we used to come to, uh, to Colombia, to Panama, to Venezuela, and when we are in these areas, we come back after Eid. So our families and the children never enjoyed Ramadan or Eid with us. This is how we started. Young men and young women. And if you have the vision, you will be able to have the drive. And if you have the drive, you will be able to pave the way, not only for you, but for the generation to come after you. So my belief and dream in you that you do it much more better than somebody like myself or others. Because you are not starting from zero. You are starting from the, from the pinnacle. So you have to create another pinnacle for humanity. If we started with 20 pence, you have to start from the three, four hundred million dollars into the billions, inshallah. This is my first response to the first question. Is a part of the first question you want me to answer? Yes, sir. Yes, any, any other part of it I did not cover? Maybe one question about uh, what, what drove you to start? What drove me to start? To be very honest, I was not involved with at all in social work on humanitarian work or development work before we started i was like any young man like you men or like um, yani as at uh, ancestors but, but uh, 
And uh, I was very busy doing my study as a medical doctor, doing my doctor of medicine, but our doctor of medicine had the PhD in, in Canada and America. Very busy for this kind of things. But I had three journeys in 1982, changed my mind. In 1982, there was a massacre in Lebanon in a camp called Sabra and Shatira. In 1982, there was another conflict in a city in Syria called Hama. Nobody talks about them. In 1982, I visited Bosnia on the way back from my visit to my, my, my family in Egypt to discover how the Muslims in Bosnia were tortured and imprisoned by the communist socialist regime. These were the turning point at my journey when I was at the age of 32 at that time. But now I'm 17, you know that. I was 32, but now I'm 17. And maybe next year I'll be, I'll be what they call it, uh, seven, uh, no, 27, 27. And these three incidents who happened to be on 20 and, and 1982 were the preparation for somebody like myself to be prepared to respond to the famine in Africa, where we found that there's no Muslim charity. 1983, responding to the famine in Eritrea and Tigray. That's why we decided when I visited Sudan uh, in December 1983 and took some photograph from some people there and they told us there's a lot of refugees here, please help them. We started to kickstart on 17 January 1984, Tuesday evening at 6 o'clock. Any one of you have been with me? Yes, I can see that most of you were there in the world of a dhar, the atom. Because our father Adam uh, has got all the dhar, the atoms of the whole humanity at his back. And sister in the red scarf, you were one of them. Yes, the one was coughing now. You were one of these atoms at the back of Adam, alayhi salam. Then all of you, Alam al-Dhar, or the world of atoms. Yes, brother, uh, master of all, inshallah. <laughs> Barakallahu uh, uh, Any questions anybody has before I'm going to move on? Yusuf? Yes. Okay. So the question that you had is, your background was in, medi in medical uh, field. Uh -huh. And at some point you started focusing your time on the social service. Yes. Um, did you have any pushback from your family, from friends, from others telling you what's wrong with you? Why would you go into this field? Why don't you just continue into the medical area? Yeah, I was in the medical field and then there was a lot of questions by some of my friends. Recording in progress. Some of my friends and uh, some of my friends, but never was my wife. And this was one of the reasons for the success story of Islamic leave that you see nowadays. And this is a message for the sisters in the room. And the message of, of, of for the brothers in the room. The brother in the is it is it black and uh, blue and uh, you 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 first one. <laughs> is, is it a, a track on your shirt or what? What was this track? Yeah, it's uh, Adidas. There is. Yes, it's Adidas. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Adidas. <laughs> when you marry somebody, brother. You look at the one who will stand with you to support you, to build you. When you, st when you marry somebody, sisters, you stand to somebody who will respect you, protect you, and empower you. And this is a relationship. It's not the dandy-doo-doo brother 
who was good looking, was hairless, like myself, or curly hair, like myself when I was Omar Sharif long time ago, or the Dudu Budi sister, who is very attractive. This is not good enough. The goodness is somebody to be with you all the time. When you are facing challenges, they are with you. When you are actually at difficulties, they are with you. They never give up. And this was the role of the family. So the family in my, on, uh, in, in my case study was the most important element of the success story of Islamically. And this is how we receive people like you today and we receive hundreds and thousands of people more and more and more in years to come. Because the first seed has been put nearly 38, 39 years ago in a tree that is deeply rooted in the depth of the ocean of humanity to create a lot of seeds to be taken by flying birds and take such seeds to throw it different parts of the world. My first visit to Canada was 1993 when we were registering Islamic Relief in UN. Then we're registering Islamic Leaf in, in, in USA in 1993 as well. You see, the vision, the vision, sisters and brothers, why did we visit Canada in 1993? Why did we visit USA in 1993? To throw the seeds in Canada and in USA. So this Kalima Tayyiba, Mathalu, الكلمة الطيبة كشجرة طيبة أصلها ثابت وفرعها في السماء تؤتي أكلها كل حين بإذن ربها The good word is like the good tree It's deeply rooted, steady but its branches are high in the skies and bear its fruit, fruits differently at different season, different fruits. From different branch, different fruit. So look at the Kalima Tayyiba, which is you, which is Islamic relief at that time. Every branch of such a tree is bearing different fruits at different season. Every year. And you in this room are such Kalima Tayyiba, each one of you. Like this tree, this fruitful tree, this powerful, deeply rooted tree, tree, because your strength and steadiness is based on Tawheed. La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. You are the Kalima Tayyiba, you are the good word. And you are the Shajar Tayyiba, and you are the good word, the good tree, inshallah. Yes, brother. MashaAllah. Dr. Hani, can we just go back to what you said about the support that you received from your wife? Yes. And give us a bit more. Tell us more about what was that support? How was that help? She never made a complaint. Listen, sisters, huh? She never made a complaint. She never made a complaint. She never said, I go to daddy or mommy or sister or auntie or whatever, or uncle. She had five children. Lonely. Did not speak the language. But she was the queen of the kingdom of home or house. And she was protecting them and myself and giving me the space to travel. The space to think, the space to leave them alone, but in her custodianship. And this is where the value of the family in any society is extremely important. Don't be taken, young people, by people telling you, no, 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 you are not ready for marriage. Yeah, marriage is, 
is going to control your freedom. Uh, some man will come to you at home, tell you what to do. Some woman will come to you at home, will, will nag you. This is wrong. The most important unit in building nations, building civilization, is the family. That's why this, this continuous absenteeism from home is covered by an extremely noble character called wife. And she was the dream of my mother. Once upon a time, brother and sisters, she, my mother saw a dream that my late uh, father-in-law came and gave her an apple. In Egypt at that time, in the 60s, I think, or the 70s, the kilo of an apple was three pounds, Egyptian pounds. My salary in the 70s was 17 pounds. So nobody can have 17 pounds of salary, can afford to buy one kilo of apple. It's super luxury. And she interpreted that something will happen between the two families, and it happened and it came my luck. That is how family and wife and the husband and the understanding between both of them is extra important. Sometimes people say that we don't have the chemistry to look at one another. My chemistry came when we live through our life with one another. It will become يعني, very solid chemistry to build extremely solid foundation and when such a foundation made me to be honored to be with you today, inshallah. Yes, sister, in the velvet color, uh, hijab. Yeah, 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 this is the first table. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see that you are giggly. Yes, brother. <laughs> All right, I thought some hands, so I'm gonna see their questions. Make yes, them yes. short. Go for it. Yes. Okay, so the question, Dr. Hani, is yes. how, what was the process for Islamic elite relief to grow? The how did you go about that? Because yeah. sometimes it's, it's worrisome to start growing things yeah. and then seeing it not stay the same quality or yeah. same service. The, 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 the process of the growth of Islamic relief was as follows. The first five years from 84 to 89 were just legging UK. Going around and around and around and around and around like donkeys. And I love donkey. I respect donkey. Donkey is intelligent, not stupid. And don't ever call somebody a donkey as an insult. Because I am the donkey lover. This number one. From the 1991-92, we started to look globally to go from UK after we have a constituency to go to Europe and America to open offices in different parts of the world. That's why this era from 1991-2 and 3 we were looking at offices in Central Asian Republic like Kazakhstan, like Azerbaijan, like Ukraine like even Russia, like Chechnya and the others. We're looking at Bulgaria. We're looking at this area of coming out of the Soviet Union. At the meantime, we're looking at the fundraising offices, which is UK, France, Belgium, Holland, Germany, and USA to raise the fund, to balance between the fund that we raise and the needs of the people that actually we address. This was from 1992 to nearly 1999. During this period, we were responding, we were, we were, we were, we were the, the quickest organization responding to emergencies. 
Let me take you to the journey. 1989, it was Sudan flood. We were there with a plane with 500 ex-military, ex-army tents. 1990, 1990, when it's a quake in uh, Iran, we were ahead before all the Husseiniyat of the Shia brother and the other mosques. And we raised at least quarter million pound at that time to send it with the uh, Iranian Red Crescent as in kind donation. In 1991, we were responding to Bangladesh flooding or cyclone. 25 million people were underwater, reminding us of what's happening to Bangladesh today. In 1992, we were one of the first people as an organization who were forecasting the conflict in Bosnia. And we left the Bosnia issue from 1992 to 1995. End of 1994, 1995, we were responding to the conflict between the Chechen and the Russian. It was December 1995. We were on the move. No rest. And we were young and strong and able to have the message to deliver and the mission to accomplish. So during this 90s period, then after that it came Kosovo. We were ready for Kosovo. 1999. So between 1992 and 1999, we were even to the Armenia earthquake as well. Between 1992 and 1999, we were there on the road all the time. Then when September 11 came, we were ready for it. You know what we did? We decided not to put our head down, but to raise our head high. Seriously, I'm looking and staring at you. And I'm saying, never ever put your head down when there's a tsunami coming. Stand up and try to face it with what you have. What the discussion, three of us, me, the head of, uh, the head of uh, communication, and the head of IT. And the head of communication was an English brother, was well, not Muslim. Said, let us put our head down. Said, no way. Would on our dead body because we are a part of the Muslim community in Europe and the America and the West and we have to face the consequences to respond to anyone if we could have put our head down at that time we could not have been here today we were after all the media to respond or even to be, to be proactive we had a session to be trained in how to face the camera. Five of us. We made one global spokesman and a deputy. And no one in 24 countries can, can respond to any uh, media unless it goes to the main spokesman and his deputy. This is how it went at the first five years then the first uh, 10 years afterwards, till about 2001. And now, the many, many good trees of Islamic leaf in different parts of the world. It's not trees nowadays, become forests, become jungles, become philosophy of thinking, become ideology, become aspiration, become dream. Not only for young people like you, but for young people who are waiting to be helped by you. This is how it went. Naturally. Naturally. It will come to you naturally because you believe in your mission. And you deliver a message that you believe in it. That's why it went naturally. From country to country, from continent to continent, from culture to culture, from philosophy of thinking to philosophy of thinking. This how it went. MashaAllah. Dr. Hani, maybe a follow-up question on this. Yes, sir. How did you go about recruiting other people? 
So you had that vision, you had that idea, but you had to have people working with you and then placing them in different countries and all of this. How did you go about that? And maybe some learning. Yeah. How did you employ and pick up the good young people like you? First of all, in the 80s, most of the people were surrounding me and my colleague were secondary school students or university students. Did you hear this? Shall I say it again? Secondary school students or university students. When we were settling in the uh, beginning of the 90s, five or six or seven young people who took Islamic leave to the global sphere. Anwar Khan is next to you in, uh, in uh, America. Faji Itani is in London. Sakandra Ali is working for DFID at the government of UK in Turkey. Nasr Haji Hamid used to become to, to be the CEO of Islamic Relief. Uh, who else? Uh, Salah Saeed was now the CEO of DSC, which is like actually the Humanitarian Coalition in Canada. And uh, Salah Saeed Mustafa Osman was actually, we called him the arrowhead. We we'll throw him everywhere, but he come back uh, safe. Want to get rid of him, but he never die. He, he's still working, hyperactive. Hyperactive. Those young people and the others were the engine which took Islamic leave from Birmingham to the globe. I said in the 80s, student, uh, uh, secondary school students and university students, at the beginning of the 90s, people, average age of them is 25, 26, 27. They were actually picked and chosen. And in Ahrun Atalla, as well, who was working for this big establishment in Italy. Those came and were the engine. Then we were headhunters at that time to get the best of what we can see before Islamic League became institutionalized. Have policies, procedures, law, and all these sort of things. So this period seen the most dynamic activities of the growth of any startup organization. Because people at your age, sisters and brothers, of course we have some more, some girls with us, like Jangir Malik and Sister Shaheen. You know Sister Shaheen and Jangir Malik when they came to, to USA in 1993? We requested them to have a flat with an extra room. And then this extra room to be the office. We'll pay the rent for that extra room. And, and Shaheen used to do the back support to her, to, to Jangir as assistant to him. Shaheen, what, was somebody now is in uh, Brunei called Fahmida. Somebody else called, uh, she's, she's, she's the head of a medical center now. It's called, uh, I can't remember the name. Uh, she's a very nice lady. They started with us. It's not, it's not only men, a young men at that time. Fahmida Jannat, she's Sister Heaven. I just call her Sister Heaven. And Samira, Mahliya, all those people started at that time with us, as young girls, as young men. Then after that, it became uh, institutionalized. If we step back a little bit from Islamic relief, yes, like you've been around the world, mashallah, you've been involved in many different areas. What would you say are the major issues that need to be addressed right now in society or in the world in general? And then the follow-up question is going to be, what's your advice? Where should the youth focus? 
It depends what you mean by major issues. Okay. Is major issues politically, security, theologically, philosophically, humanitarian, or developmental? Major issues are major issues. For us as Muslims, the major issues facing us is Islamophobia. At the back of terrorism. Or how to fight terrorism. Unfortunately, up till now, young brothers and sisters, United Nations did not agree on a definition of terrorism. But 180 countries on earth are fighting something that they do not agree on what is this something. How wicked such political leadership of the world. This is very serious, brother and sisters. We are fighting an enemy that we don't know who is he. If you defend your country, you are a terrorist. If you defend your family, you are a terrorist. If you defend your theology, you are a terrorist. We don't know who is terrorist and who is not. So these two things, back to back, are actually a major issue for all the Muslims across the globe. This is from actually the, the ideological, philosophical background. Okay. From the uh, humanitarian response background, we are extremely emotional, like any other communities. We respond to the disaster when it happened. We respond to the cause of protection of young girls when they are raped. We respond to the displacement when it happened. We never been prepared to prevent this. That's why research is not on the table. That's why advocacy is not on the table. That's why uh, uh, communication not working and training and capacity building not on the table. Only fundraising, 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 fundraising. So what? We have organizations with their bank accounts filled with tens of millions of dollars, but they cannot do anything with it because the banking are blocking them. We have to stand up together to fight for the rights of the people that we claim that we are serving. This is how we need to look objectively on something, not the traditional. So if I can take you to the journey, which I call it my journey. My journey was divided into five phases. The first phase is the donkey ship philosophy. Donkey ship philosophy. Work as hard as a donkey. I am one of the people who try to work as hard as a donkey. Especially at your age, in the 20s. To gain as much experience and knowledge as you can. To move from the donkey ship period into the wake-up caller. من الحمورية إلى المسحرات. تضحك لا يا حبيب أنت أنت عربي. اللبس أديد هذا. عارف الحمورية يعني إيه؟ Explain to them in English in Canada. What do you mean by humoria? Tell them, stand up and tell them what do I mean by humoria? <laughs> so going from humoria or the donkey ship stage into the wake up call because you'll have experience. You'll be able to stand up in the middle of the square on the in the city and advocate. Connect, communicate, and give us the wake-up call, like the wake-up caller in Ramadan. The second phase. The third phase, which is after 30 years of hard working, you become like a blending mixer, or mix, blending mixer, is that right? When you sit down with young people like yourself, and somebody as young as myself at the age of 17, and I receive the good ideas from you, 
to put in the blending machine, then we'll produce a new product for you to use. So you feel that the product is yours. So when you sit down with old people, or yeah, sorry, no, not old, young people like myself, at the age of what, sister? 17. One, seven. So to give you, to, re, to, to reform your ideas into a product. Then you go and use this product. To do what? The fourth stage is community building. To do community building. Then when you spend this 40 or 30 or 50 years, you start to prophesize and you become community prophet. Not a large prophet because there's no more prophets anymore. Prophesizing. So from the donkey to the prophecies. من الحمورية إلى النبوة المجتمعية. Yes, brother. Tell them from donkey ship into uh, prophethood of community. So I love the donkey. That's why all the time I when I come next to donkey, I give salam to him or to her. Was Miss Donkey or Mr. Donkey? Five stages, and you have to go through it. Yes, sister? At the back. Yes, ready for a second question. Uh, I'm going to open it up to hear from some of the youth and maybe their questions. So that way we can we can make sure that we cover their their, their needs. Reem? Reem al alqa'a bain al-bani wa al-alami. It's a poetry. Abu Faras al-Hamadani, I think, or Imr al I can't remember. When the Arabs used to be poets. Poets? Poets? Yes, poets. poets. Come on, Reem. Okay. So the question, Dr. Hani, is, did you ever reach a point where you said, No. Enough? I can't take this anymore. I told you no. No. The second question is... I love you. Was the most I love Sister Reem. Sister Reem, just, just wait, 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 wait. Send my love to Sister Reem. No. Okay, Come, I'll answer later on. Second one. Uh, the second one will just follow up. So if no, what was the most challenging part of the journey? Why no? Whenever you feel down, go to the people who can charge your heart, your mind and soul. Go to the people that you claim that you are helping them. Be with them. Listen to them. Interact with them. Live with them and come back fresh. The most difficult journey you spend in Asia and Africa or Latin America is empowering your soul. And releasing your soul. And renewing your energy. That's why people like Sister Reem and all of you in the room, when they feel down, they go and mix with the people. They claim that they are serving. Because what? They will find that such people are deprived of what we have in Canada, what we have in America, what we have in the West, have nothing like what we have, but they have a smile from the heart. They have wisdom from the back of their mind, which you don't have. They look at life differently. That's why we never stop or feel that we are running out of energy. This is the first question. What's the second question, brother? In your journey, what was the most challenging part? The most challenging part is up till now is find new leadership. Creating new leadership, which Alhamdulillah, that we started this year or last year with this program. Because each one of you is a leader by quality that Allah has given him and her. But each one of you did not discover the wealth that Allah has put in our hearts, at the back of our mind and our souls. You have been born a leader. Sisters and brothers, discover your strength 
and you'll be able to discover your talent. Once you discover your talent, you start investing it and you become a leader. It's a dream which you started to think about it 20 years ago in 2004. Up to now, unfortunately, I myself as an individual could not be able to build this process or this uh, journey or this movement. But Alhamdulillah, for this program, it will be the, the beginning of it. This is number one. Number two challenge is to produce our philosophy of thinking, to produce our ideology, our culture, to write our own history. People are not interested in history, in culture, in ideology, in philosophy of thinking. You know why? Because whenever you receive a donation from some organization, it's quoted philosophically, ideologically, and culturally by the donor. Who will compel you to do what they want? Whether this is goes with your religion, with your values, with your morality, or against it. Whether they are Muslims or non-Muslims. Because even some of the Muslim donors putting you to corners as well, unfortunately. So this kind of things which I need young people like you, not only to specialize in medicine, engineering, technology, which is good, but to specialize as well in political science, humanitarian, uh, studying humanitarian subjects, studying art, studying history, studying geography, as well. Because doctors do not run countries. Engineers do not become presidents. Isn't it? It's thinkers, historians, philosophical people who can actually make the change while the doctors are very busy treating thousands of patients. Have no, have no, 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 no time to be with their families. That's why while some of us could become doctors and engineers, others could become doing the other things. It should be that some group amongst us start to have different specialism. We should not do the same thing all, all of us. But the most important thing, brothers and sisters, is how this is very painful for me, is how to create our philosophy and to let our philosophy to shape the culture of other communities, not only our community. Philosophy is something which is not tangible, but it's something which goes with your ideas, goes with your culture, goes with your thinking ability without knowing. It comes naturally from the bedtime story of your mother and your grandma, your, 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 your friends, from the history. This philosophy is very important. And these are the challenges which is a never-ending story, brother. I can see four hands from the sister side and no hands from the agent side. Alhamdulillah, we have. We yeah, have. Okay. Jawad. Ah, Jawad. But our four sisters and one Jawad? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah, Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Father Jawad, brother Horse. Yeah, he, he, he's asking the question, but you can't hear him. I'm going to just hear yeah, it, yeah. and I'll tell you something. Our brother Karim, Karim, generous, generous. <laughs> okay. So, so the question is, 
probably as the Islamic relief was growing, there also there was a growing number of people that were trying to stop it or limit it yeah. or uh, tarnish its image. Yeah. How did you deal with this? Any, any advice yeah, yeah. about how to deal with those situations? While we were growing, there were a lot of enemies. Actually, up till now. I call them the enemies of humanity. The enemies of freedom. We have been suffering from such individuals, such institutions, such organizations, such even states who demean themselves by trying to stop a very vibrant organizations, organizations with S, by trying to block extremely timely needed organizations. Because they don't believe in what? In civil society sector. Listen to this, brothers and sisters in the room, or sisters and brothers in the room. They don't believe in civil society sector. Because civil society sector create civil society organization and movement. Create. Creates what they call uh, critical masses. Critical individuals. You know what I mean by critical masses? Critical masses are such individuals who can make the change collectively because they have the brain and the collective power in a free space, they can make the change. Such states do not like that. That's why it's not only against Islamic relief. No, it's against the sector as a whole. Civil liberty space. You have the greatest leaders of civil liberty in America. Malcolm X, Rahmatullahi, Martin Luther King as well, Nelson Mandela as well, Mahatma Gandhi in, in India, and Alia Eza Begovic in Bosnia and others. Civil liberty leaders paid their life, paid their life to stand up to defend not only their countries, but the freedom of humanity against the corrupt states who are actually stealing the resources from their country. This is a challenge that we are facing. Nowadays, we are facing also a weaker UN family, politically controlled by certain countries. That's why sometimes does not know where to go, right, left, or center. Because what we call it security council. These are the challenges, not only facing us, but facing the globe as a whole. But your role is to stand up for the civil liberty for everyone. For everyone. For everyone. Not only for the Muslims. In spite of the fact that the Muslims are suffer more than any other uh, religious uh, or people on earth. Thank you, Brother Jawad. We're going to have a last question, unfortunately. And it's I can stay with you till tomorrow. Allah, for the very quick. It's like a Farah. Sister Farah. Oh, Sister uh, Wedding. Longer. I can hear her. Okay. Yesterday there was a conversation that we were having with the youth and we were telling them you have to focus on your education but that, that's, that should not be it. You have to have a cause that you're going to focus on, you're going to drive, something you're doing for the ummah, the community, society. So the question that they ask it is, in your case, uh, you started in the medical field. Did you give up that field and then uh -huh. moved into another area? Did you continue with both? And what's your advice in general for the youth about, especially at their secondary and university, yeah. how to focus on both? So, you're just you're focusing on education, on career or future, 
and you are asking me what did I do with my medical career and what I am doing now. Is that right? Yes? That is correct. Thank you. Sometimes I understand English. First of all, education is not one size fits all. Nowadays, education became a big system. Some of the education could be structured within the state. Some of it is not structured inside the state. It's not like our time. I have to go to school. I have to pass. I have to go to university. I have to pass. It's become different. With the freedom of choice nowadays, each one of us is compelled to be educated. Because the first word of Quran was Iqra. Allah said Iqra to somebody, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who knew that Muhammad could not be able to read and write. Why did he send, make the first word Iqra? Iqra is seek knowledge. Ikra is comprehend the knowledge. Ikra is extract the knowledge from other knowledge. Ikra is create opinion. Ikra is extrapolation. This is Ikra. Whether it's in science, technology, anything. It seeks it. There's some structured state education and some non-structured state education, non-state education. But actually, at the end of the day, you must be master of what you have, of your subject. Or you can create a new subject for yourself. In my case, I came from Cairo to UK in, 19, in November 1977. As a young medical doctor, when we are qualified, we have five objectives. خمسة عين معايا يا أديدس عروسة عربية explain to them in English عروسة عربية عمارة عيادة and عزبة فضل explain a wife a clinic a building a car and a clinic this was the doctor's main objective in his life, or her life. Not in his life, because he's going to marry a, a, a young, beautiful girl. But all these objectives came differently. That's why, uh, by 1983, my objective became differently. And started to grow to the other side, to the social side. By uh, 19... Uh, 80, Sabra and Shatila, 82. Yes. I was instead of sitting uh, 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 down to study for the membership exam in uh, at the end of 82, beginning of 83, I was going outside to distribute leaflet door to door and street street for Sabra and Shatila massacre. And from there, the switch came to the other direction. I got my doctor of medicine, which is MD, which is PhD at your side, in 1991. With a lot of donkey ship work. Because at that time, I was working extremely hard, alhamdulillah, for my PhD to collect the data. But I was so stupid of not correcting my English and not reviewing my references. So I failed miserably. But when I failed miserably, one of the examiners said that, no, Dr. Elbanna thesis is something that we need to have in our library. So the Dean of the Royal College of Pathology was the head of the pathology department in the medical school of Birmingham University, sat me down in front of him. Tell me, honey, I said, yes, sir. I want your thesis in my library. 
I gave you one year to correct the mistakes, the major mistakes. Will you be able to do this? I said, yes. You know, sisters and brothers in the room, I gave or I made a gratitude to someone at that time. And this gratitude did not upset them. You know what was my gratitude for? Any any idea? Any idea? Any idea? Any idea? To Allah. In three pages. Gratitude is written in one line. In one paragraph. But for my case, the three pages about the creation of man. The creation of man. And this did not fail me. Because the subject or the material was outstanding. Not only that, I corrected the name of the first one who discovered spina bifida and anencephaly five centuries before Europe. His name was Bukasas in Latin, but his name was supposed to be Abu Qasim al Zahrawi. I changed his name in my thesis. So when one of the people who was supporting me, a professor supporting me to correct my English, sat down with me to help me, said, what is, what is all this Quran? Three pages? What is that? I came back to him, telling him, sir, isn't this a scientific knowledge or not? He said, yes. He said, do you want me to remove it? He said, no, keep it. You twist the iron with an iron. Not twist the iron with the, uh, what do you call it, uh, wood. Will not work. Alhamdulillah, this is what happened. Then by 1995, I gave up medicine altogether. I went to my mother in 1992 in Egypt with a visit there with a grand mufti of Bosnia at that time. I gave her my photograph with the, with the graduation photograph. I said, Mommy, said, what? I said, Khalas, enough is enough. I'm not going to be a doctor anymore. I said, go out. So she was the one behind me trying to have a son of her as a doctor. And for her, alhamdulillah, I wanted to honor her wish to become a doctor, but not doctor anymore. I'm not regretting it. Because I discovered that many more professional doctors can do the job far more better than myself. And for me, I found my strength in becoming a street worker and a street cleaner. And maybe young man who can talk to younger people like yourself. So I'm not regretting it. I'm very happy. And, and you bring all those people with you to travel with me one day and see who are going to be tired. Ask I, all... I told them, Dr. Hani, that uh, we're going to take them for a six-month trip in Yemen with you. Because ah, ah, I remember ah. that's what you told me the day that I came presenting the idea to the board. <laughs> that's right, that's right, that's right. <laughs> like, it's been well, like, a pleasure, Dr. Hani. Jazakallah khair for your time, uh, for your wisdom, yours of wisdom, and for spending all this time with us. Uh, I'm pretty sure we're going to call on you, inshallah, for more events to join us, inshallah. Um, I want a, a warm thank you for Dr. Hani. It's time. And I want to, uh, you've seen him at the beginning when he started, where he was like waving with his hand. Well, I want to ask you to do the wave going through here to say thank you to Dr. Hani. So we're going to start from this side here. Okay, and you're gonna go with me on the signal. You guys ready? So you're gonna go up, down, and then we'll have the others. All right. Ooh, okay. And uh, please, uh, Brother Shab, if you can send me the recording, because this is a memorable time of my life to be living 
with lively, uh, energetic, uh, futuristic people from Canada. I never have dreamt in my life that the day will come that the Canada will be honoring me by letting me to talk to its younger generation. Thank you. May Allah continue to use you uh, for the benefit of the Ummah and society overall. And then we hope you continue to be our mentor and support us, inshallah. Uh, I'll be in Bosnia in, uh, after Eid. If, if, if somebody would like to jump on a plane to meet me. <laughs> With, 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 I, I was told I, I missed Dr. Hani by I think two or three weeks in the Inspire program of Islamic Relief, and I was told it's the best program is to go with him at the time when they have the anniversary of the massacre that happened in Bosnia. Yes. So, if anyone of you is interested about the Inspire program, check it out on Islamic Relief and try to join them, inshallah. I know some of you are joining us on the program. Yes, me and you're going to Turkey, so. Please do that. I think he does it almost uh, every year. So please join him. Inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alaikum assalamu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. You inspired me. Now I am over the moon. <laughs> Can you please bring me down? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.